Remember yesterday we started talking a little bit about real-time payments and Vocalink, the principal sponsor of the conference, has developed immediate payment solutions in places like Singapore and the United States. So to tell us more about the real-time payments revolution, please welcome Vocalink's managing director, Paul Stoddart. I'm going to try not to mention the word platform, but uh, I don't know if I'll get through it without doing so. Um, thank you very much for inviting me down here, and I... Uh, I don't know how many of you were at the dinner, I suspect a lot of you, um, but we had a very inspirational speaker at the dinner last night, and uh, I don't know how well I'll do against that, but um, I certainly think if you haven't seen Cam, then you should take the opportunity to see him uh, and at least read a bit about him. Um, I'm going to spend 40 minutes or so talking to you a little bit about the Vocalink journey, and I think that that's a good way of conveying uh, the the real-time instant payment, I mean, there's lots of descriptions that people use these days. But I, I want to take you through a little journey, and I think it'll be, there'll be many parts of it that will be relevant to all of you, depending on where you are in the payments industry and the banking industry. Uh, but you know, I, I am extremely enthusiastic and passionate about payments. I didn't think I'd ever be saying that 20 years ago. Uh, and trying to find a way to make what you know, I also say to my marketing team, it's not a particularly interesting topic when you're doing a presentation. And we've got some videos, and I'm going to ask you to vote on some things as well as we go through the, the presentation. So, a little bit about Vocalink. Um, the business has, in one way, shape, or form, been around for about, about 50 years, give or take. Um, and in the UK, we run the... ATM network, the link interchange network, that connects 65,000, actually I think it's 68,000 ATMs now, it's the largest ATM network in the world. We run the BAX clearing system, which is which, uh, one of the first clearing systems in the world, uh, automated clearing system for payments into bank, takes about three days clearing system. And then the faster payment system was launched in 2008, and the faster payment system is a credit transfer system. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Um, one of the first real-time or near real-time payment systems to be launched. And uh, frankly, has seen some quite phenomenal growth. You can imagine, if you can, back in 2008, there were a few other things going on in the banking industry at that point in time. <laughs> a number of the banks were a little bit worried as, as, as whether they'd still be in business. Um, but I do understand that New Zealand was some, somewhat insulated from the global financial crisis, which is a, a fortunate place to be. But in 2008, something called Faster Payments was launched, and for the first few years, not a lot happened. And we'll talk a little bit about the business case for real-time payments, but you can imagine the banks at the time had made a decision actually back in 2005 to invest in an infrastructure, and they didn't want to do it then, and they don't really want to do it now. Uh, and I speak from experience having worked for RBS for 12 years and Barclays for five years. Um, but, you know, things came together. The government was insistent and they made the investment. And then this platform came to market in 2008. And as I said, not a lot happened for a couple of years. And it was only after recovery started from the global financial crisis that, um, and I'm going to use the word, that the platform started to provide some utility for participants in the market. And at that stage, it was primarily the banks, and it was primarily the tier one banks. And I'll come back to a little bit more about how that's developed and the growth. But as you can see, we've grown the business now um, into several markets. Uh, we launched in 2014 the Singapore system called FAST, which is uh, an ISO 2002-based API oriented um, instant payment system using a pre-funded net settlement system. And it was, as I said, launched in 2014. It has now 20, 22 banks connected to it. Um, and it has been one of the beacons in, in Southeast Asia. And as a consequence, a number of other markets have started to make choices to implement these platforms. Um, and fortunately, we've been at, at the heart of providing the technology, and we're doing the same in Thailand at the moment, and as, a, as a, was introduced also in the US. 
Some of the other things, a little bit about the, the company. We, we run something called an account switching service, uh, which I haven't seen talked about much in, in other markets around the world, but I have a feeling over time it will start to get uh, talked about a little bit more. And it basically allows a, a consumer or a business to switch their bank account within seven days with all the payments and all the cards and all the gumph that goes with opening a bank account all done automatically using actually the clearing system as a, as a system that carries all of the data between the banks that allows the, the account to be opened and the payments to be continually redirected if they are uh, misinstructed once those accounts have been opened. And the latest um, product, if you like, to be born from within the Vocalink business is something called Acura. And it's really about data analytics and insight and leveraging the near 100 billion transaction records that we, held, that we hold in our systems um, that are unable to derive insights from that data to help banks, businesses, consumers make better decisions, faster decisions, um, tailor their products and services more effectively. So um, that's a little introduction to Vocalink. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to take questions towards the end or afterwards. Um, and please find me if you want to know a little bit more about the business. Um, I certainly hope that it, it will be a um, great opportunity for us to spend a bit more time in the market talking to banks and, and stakeholders. But what are we seeing? So real-time payments, where's it going? Why is it important? Why should we all be paying attention to it? Um, I think we are, we are probably in a period, I, I suspect it's between five and ten years, but I think we will, we will see probably all of the major economies globally and probably around half of the developing economies implement a real-time payment system within the next ten years. Which is a pretty bold statement, actually. Um, there's probably around ten to twelve markets that can say that they have that today, it's that, that similar capability. What we're seeing is an is a increasing pace of adoption, multiple drivers in, in, uh, in different markets, but we're seeing multiple drivers for adoption, some coming from the government, some coming from major customers and corporates in the market, some coming from the banks themselves, some coming from consumers, um, particularly in markets where bank account penetration is low and smartphone penetration is high. Um, but we're seeing significant momentum building. We're seeing ISO 20022 becoming the de facto messaging standard. It's something that uh, we, we run systems on 8583, the typical card standard, uh, but we've developed our first ISO 20022 platform, the platform that went into Singapore uh, about three years ago, um, and we've been building on that since, and we will gradually our intention is to gradually replace our domestic platforms in the UK and other markets um, with, with the new platform on that standard. Smartphone penetration we see is a, is a real indicator of um, and driver for the implementation of new real-time clearing systems. And that's just because consumers and businesses want things to happen now. We all want things actually to happen now. And, and somebody said yesterday, when you have exposure to something happening in real time instantly, then actually it becomes something you just expect after a while. What's also very interesting to note is regulators are playing a, a significant role in the introduction of real time payment systems. In one way, shape or form, they are behind all of the decisions to implement these new technologies. In some cases, they play a, a much um, harder uh, role in that by being quite specific in what they expect to happen and in what time frame. In other markets, they take a softer, more nurturing approach. And I think the US is a good example of that softer, more nurturing approach. And Singapore or Thailand are good examples of that harder, more specific approach, where the banks in, in, in Asia were told that they would implement this new system within a, new, within a specific time frame. The Fed in the US spend a lot more time educating the industry, consulting with stakeholders in the market, and gradually encouraging the banks to make those investments in their infrastructure. Um, and what was quite interesting about the US is, after about 12 months of, of that industry-wide consultation and approach, 
the, uh, the industry, the banking industry themselves got together through the clearinghouse, the 30 largest banks in the US made a decision that they were going to invest in the new infrastructure. And we have been this year working with them to implement that and the platform is now about to go into closed group testing with the banks actually in December. That's, a, that's an extremely accelerated timeline for the implementation of a new infrastructure. If you think back to what I was saying about faster payments, it took about two to three years to make the decision to, to, to make the change and then invest in the infrastructure another two years. The service went live in 2008. Things are happening much more quickly with the right drivers in place. Um, previous speaker talked a lot about access. Uh, I, I concur. Open access, ubiquity for these new payment systems is absolutely critical. And we'll talk a little bit about why that's important. And you know, using the word platform again um, provides a platform for innovation. So using the APIs, but not just the APIs as an approach for providing access, but actually being able to embrace participants, small banks, large banks, non-banks, um, corporates, merchants, consumers, giving them an opportunity to create those sort of positive feedback loops again uh, as to the development of functionality and capability. A lot of that you see uh, certainly in the UK and, and in a number of other markets through mobile banking. And that, it, that itself is, is a phenomenon um, that it has been quite exciting, the speed of adoption of mobile banking. So, if you just look around the world, and the, as I mentioned, the different drivers for implementation, the dots represent the markets where something's happening now or has happened in the last 12 months. And um, the, the names are Government, Central Bank, Card Association. That's basically where the drivers are coming from. In some cases, it's all of them in each market. In, in other cases, it's one or two playing a more central role. There's quite a broad range of drivers. And I noticed in the panel yesterday, there was, a, I, and I, I can understand it, but a degree of um, reticence around who really wants it. But actually, we see the same discussion happening in every market. And the participants in the market go through that, that learning loop of, so why do I need it? What can I do with it? What's the business case? What, how does it pay back? What do my customers think about it? How do I fit it in with everything else that I'm doing? But the momentum is building and it's driven by not just one participant, but multiple participants in many markets. So I'm gonna ask you a little question. Um, so if you could, get your app uh, open on your phone. And uh, basically, I'm going to ask you the question of how many of you have a mobile banking app on your phone? I've asked this question in over the last 12 months, I've asked it several times in a number of events that I've spoken at. So how many of you have a mobile banking app on your phone? You probably can guess the answer, but it'd be interesting to see. Okay, let's have a look. 90%, I think that's quite a resounding um, mobile banking support base. Five years ago, that would have been probably zero. In five years, nearly all of us in this room are now, and I'm assuming you're using it, you're not just got it on, the app, on your phone because it looks good, um, but actually, in five years' time, or five years ago, that was zero, pretty much. I don't think there was any market that had launched a mobile banking service um, in the world that I can think of. Anyway, um, I think that tells you a few things that and I think Dave mentioned this in his speech yesterday as well, that mobile banking experience, you, the, your bank identifying you through using strong customer authentication through your mobile banking app will, be, um, uh, will underpin almost all of the interactions you have with your bank going forward, whether it's banking, payments, buying products, sending money, et cetera. Anyway, so we're looking at now Moving on from the mobile banking, just the, just the consumer, building on the consumer a little more, looking at the changing behavior of the consumer and why that's important 
and why that is another driver for the adoption of real-time payment systems. So I think mobile and real-time go hand in hand, and that's one of the important aspects of delivering a payment system through that medium for the consumer. We constantly do research around the uh, use of mobile banking, the changing nature of, of payments and behavior of payments. But smartphone adoption indication, as I mentioned before, along with bank account penetration, are, are two um, of the most important indicators for um, the demand for real-time payments and subsequently the utilization of real-time payments <coughs> infrastructure. I think the mobile banking stat is actually more interesting given the growth, but, but actually we're looking at many, many markets now around the world where smartphone penetration is, is very high. And in markets where pen smartphone penetration and bank account penetration is high, utility of payment systems, particularly systems delivered through mobile, are, are very high. In markets where some of the developing markets that we're working in we see not just bank accounts, but any kind of financial account, a prepaid account, a mobile operator provided wallet, any form of account through which you can transact connected with your mobile de device creates a high utility, high demand environment for a real-time payment system. And we can do quite a lot through these mobile banking apps now, integrating rewards, integrating um, actually being able to view your balance before you transact was something that, that uh, consumers absolutely loved. As we started developing with the banks in the UK, the, the, these mobile payment services, we found that just simple features like, uh, it gives me comfort to know how much money I have in my bank account before I make a, a transaction, a, a really high utility value. And so as the UK banks have started to evolve and, and many banks around the world, um, your money, your banking app, your phone are inextricably connected now. I think a number of the speakers have talked about how the, the environment is getting very complex that we operate in. And as a bank, everything that we do at Vocalink tends to be, I would say, we call it bank friendly. So it's driven and developed for banks to provide to their customers. And what we hear a lot from, from the banks around the world is how threatened they feel by all these new entrants into their space, whether it's peer-to-peer um, -peer lending, whether it's um, payments, whether it's wallet providers, merchant acquirers, etc. The world has got very complex for the consumer and very threatening for the banks. So as we go through the last few years, you can see the rise of participants entering the market, looking for opportunities essentially to redirect revenue away from the traditional um, areas of, of, of banking and payments um, and building their businesses by essentially running on top of the infrastructure that the banks and, and governments have invested uh, in the markets. As a consumer, I am bombarded constantly with, uh, with companies uh, hungry for my business, uh, hungry for, for being a, a utility provider to me in some way, shape, or form. That is a very complex landscape now for anyone to navigate. When we spoke to these participants as, as indirect customers of payment systems and clearing systems, the, the demand further increase, or the, the, uh, the level of demand for access to real-time payment systems, either indirectly or directly, so through their banks or through some sponsor or agency type solutions, uh, was fairly consistent at a very high level across all of the markets we spoke to. So, um, uh, just picking up on another comment that one of the panelists made yesterday, is so what am I going to do with this new infrastructure? So what, what will my customers do with this infrastructure if it were made available to them? And these are the examples of, um, in, in the UK, but also in other markets, in Singapore in particular, and as 
as part of business cases that banks are building in the markets where they are making decisions to implement real-time systems, these are the areas where utility is high, where uh, we see significant portions of transaction flow falling in these categories. Insurance payouts, government is a huge driver. Uh, in Thailand, the government are using the new prompt pay real-time system to distribute payments to farmers. Uh, it is the only way, as a farmer, you can receive a particular payment from the government. And so, as you can imagine, they've had 15 million registrations for the uh, service uh, before it's even launched. Money remittance, daily weekly wages, peer-to-peer -peer payments, um, loan fulfillment, electronic bill presentment and payment. In fact, EBPP will be the first service that the US goes live with when their new platform uh, launches in the first quarter of next year. Prepaid top-ups, prepaid of any kind, so not just phone, but any prepaid card top-up, um, also high utilization. Some of the other things that, that banks, I think, uh, need to be thinking about and, and markets need to be thinking about in general when we talk about real-time payments is the sort of service package, the service proposition that goes around it. Actually moving from uh, a payment operation that is typically available between sort of 10 and 3 in the afternoon, moving to something that's 24 by 7 by 365 is a fundamental shift in the way a bank and a central bank typically uh, will operate today. When we look at the profile of payments made using real-time payment systems, so profile of time, at what time in the day do most payments get made, then we start to see that consumers and businesses don't actually want to transact, or typically it's not convenient for them to transact when we think, as traditional providers of services, um, would want them to transact. So between nine and five doesn't really happen. Actually, you see a lot of transactions taking place outside of those normal working hours, and particularly at weekends. So there are some, th some things to think about as a, as a provider, as a bank, and as a central bank in particular, where uh, it's a fundamental shift from where you are today. But if done correctly, and uh, this might be something that uh, some of you hadn't um, been made aware of before, but what we're really seeing now is that overall total cost of operation, of payments operations in banks, reduces with the implementation of real-time payment systems straight through processing efficient modern messaging. The cost of change once the platform's been implemented is significantly lower than banks will typically experience today. Uh, and again, one of the speakers talked about yesterday how, I think somebody said it was, uh, used the example of UBS, of the 200 million or 2 billion that they had available, you know, 100 million was left because everything else was keeping the show on the road and compliance. Well, it, it fundamentally changes the nature of freeing up those investment budgets once that investment's been made, introducing a modern, flexible technology platform upon which change can be delivered quickly and efficiently. There's nothing particularly unique about real-time systems. That's just a, a feature of implementing modern technology. And, and that's part of the reason why it's hard to get over that investment hump initially. But actually, the benefits are real and tangible, and, and banks in a number of markets are, um, are, are counting the benefits now and sharing that with other banks in other markets. Typically, these banks also operate in multiple markets. So we see those banks being advocates of the introduction of the technology in other markets as they're going through that decision-making process. I, I probably don't need to talk to you too much about how a payment system works, but um, I think it's just important to remind everyone of the typical flow. And the, and the, important, um, the important points here are that the funds are available to the recipient of the payment immediately, within a few seconds. And as we've uh, spent time with each market, we've also started to enhance the messaging that sits around that and confirmation of payment, additional message flows, request a payment is something you'll hear a lot more as part of real-time payment system development um, becomes very important. So I can send money to you as long as you have a bank account connected to the network that I run 
I can send that to you instantly. Those funds will be made available to you instantly. And the, the settlement behind the scenes actually takes place, can take place at, at varying different times of the day. It can take place continually, every transaction is settled. Or it can take place during defined windows of during the course of the day. Singapore used five settlement cycles. We use three in the UK. And we're finding each market where there's, where there's a higher element of customization in each market, typically around the settlement, central banks have differing views as to what settlement models they'd prefer. So I, I mentioned right at the start that, that faster payments, when it was launched, nothing much happened for a couple of years. But actually, um, since the investment in utility, since the banks started to deliver services that they connected to this new infrastructure they had available, then um, the growth has been quite, quite outstanding. In fact, far more, um, far more likely to be associated with a dot-com or a startup, actually. Um, and it's quite nice to see some of that performance in a, in a UK payment system. But um, just some of the numbers to give you a feel. And I can guarantee you 100% that, that when they put the business case together, it didn't look like this. <laughs> so one trillion pounds. This year, we will process in excess of one trillion pounds through the new real-time payment system. I say new, it's eight years old now. And as you can see from the next slide, um, it has done two things. It has cannibalized the existing clearing system. So BACS, the three-day system I mentioned at the start, had direct credits and direct debits available to it. It cannibalized nearly all of the direct credit volume. That was partly deliberate, but also partly natural behavior. So the bank started to develop functionality that deliberately migrated the volume from the old system to the new. The mistake they made, in truth, was to allow the old system to continue to operate for as long because they missed an opportunity to take the real cost benefits of decommissioning an old system. But hey, that's what happens nearly all the time in banks. <laughs> and the real, I think one of the key levers, and I mentioned this earlier as well, is the ubiquity, the, the availability of, of a payment system. When faster payments went live, it went live pretty much with all the banks in the UK going live at roughly the same time. We, we did stage the, the go live, the rollout, just so not to create too much pressure on the system. But in any event, we saw all the major banks go live within a 12-month period. They all had to go live, I think, with receive only initially. Everyone had to go live with receive only. Um, some went live with both send and receive. But as a minimum, everyone had to be able to receive. And I think what this chart tells you is how important is it that within a network that it's available to everybody at the same time. And those negative feedback loops that Ross was talking about are um, quite prevalent. If I, I want to send money to somebody and I can't reach them, they're not available, then I start that negative feedback loop and utility becomes a problem. So just, um, just moving on a little bit to, so once we had this infrastructure in place and we started to think about what we could do with it, we, we um, started to develop a series of product capabilities that were designed to use the new infrastructure. And what was quite interesting um, as we look around the world, uh, as they look at implementing new systems, that the, f the focus has now moved very much from we need to do something, like introduce a new payment system, to we need to develop services on which or that can leverage the new infrastructure that we've put in place. That was the tone of Cybos this year, if some of you attended. Um, Cybos previous year and the year before that was very much about real-time payments and the need for a real-time payments infrastructure and how to build the business case. What I thought was different this year about Cybos was the tone and the discussion was about right now, what can we do with this, this fantastic new piece of infrastructure? What are the services that we can develop? And the UK started with something called PayM, which uses um, the concept of a proxy platform, also known as directories. And this technology is now forming a fundamental module in the procurement process of all the other real-time platform markets that we are working in and, and the bids that we are bidding in today. 
the, the PayM service was launched, and it basically allows me to send money to an individual person-to-person -person payment, and all I need to know about them is, is their mobile phone number. Actually, it could be any proxy, and other markets are using any proxy. Um, I authenticate myself to my bank using my uh, login process to my mobile banking app. That could be biometric-based, PIN-based, pin mostly now biometric uh, fingerprint. And once, once I've done that, I can then initiate a transaction to any party. The transaction settles or clears over the real-time uh, rails in the market, and the experience um, is excellent for the consumer. I think I've got a little video about uh, how that works. Phase two, pay by bank app. Phase two here, um, also known as Zap. Some of you uh, may have heard of Zap before. Um, this allows an any-to-any transaction to be completed. So it is a true end-to-end -end complete replacement for a card payment system. And it uses a combination of your mobile banking app, your mobile device, um, and works with the underlying real-time clearing infrastructure. So faster payments in the UK and in the other markets we're talking about the respective real-time implementations. So hopefully, I press. adopt technology is in and this is the technology they're using in Thailand coupled with the uh, instant payment platform and they're using the national ID as the proxy identifier so the government initiative is called any ID the underlying service is called prompt pay uh, but, but basically um, the government and the individual can use the national their national ID to send payments that's all they need to know about you they authenticate themselves to their bank using their mobile banking application on their phone and they can initiate a payment. I have a feeling that proxies are going to play an increasingly important role in, in, in the payment world as we move forward. And we, we, as I said, we're seeing it as part of a, a, a fundamental component in every new system that we uh, implement now. So um, uh, Pay by Bank App, I introduced the concept. It's, it's moving beyond just peer-to-peer, -peer, a complete alternative to a card payment rail solution. Um, I have to explain what it is not. It is not a wallet. It's not an app. It's not card-based. There isn't anything called multilateral interchange or interchange. It is real-time secure, digital, convenient, a full payment scheme, and it's provided by banks. And just back to the comment I made earlier, we talk about it now with the banks in the UK, and we are uh, in live proving with probably the most innovative bank in the UK, uh, and we have two of the other banks in the UK that have signed up to implement the service next year. It's been tough getting over interchange as a revenue source, competing channels within banks, understanding perhaps the need to uh, self-cannibalize a little in order to develop new revenue streams from, from customers and from payments, particularly as credit markets shrink, but, but actually, it's probably the most exciting development 
um, from a consumer perspective that's come out of the business um, and we're very excited to see that start to implement. And as I mentioned, a complete alternative. So again, taking on cash, taking on checks, taking on cards. Uh, we still have, still have checks in the UK and uh, they do in many markets. Um, but we set ourselves the ambition or the goal of being able to deliver uh, an equivalent, in fact, often the case, better experience for the consumer or the business in making a payment to any party than anything that was available to them today. So we benchmarked every use case and every transaction flow against what we consider to be the best solution today in the market. And that was cash for some types of transaction. Um, it was card, it was check, depending on the different transactions. And we backed that up by a lot of research across a number of markets as to what consumers and businesses were really looking for from a new payment utility. Did they actually have a problem with what they had available today? And, and you know, 50% of the audience roughly said, well, I don't really have any problem with, with what I do today. But as we broke down those experiences and showed them something a little better, then of course everyone that we spoke to decided that if they could have something like this available to them, then that would be a good thing, which led us to make the, the investments that we needed to make. And um, the flexibility of the platform, the use of the APIs, allows us to integrate the other sort of surrounding services that run alongside a payment. Quite often, these are the main reasons why we're making a payment. The payment actually just needs to happen seamlessly in the background um, without any fuss, and we only get annoyed if it goes wrong. But actually, these things, um, uh, loyalty, whether it's data, identity, as a bank, I actually have pretty good up-to-date records of um, my address, uh, my age, uh, and I can use those pieces of information. This is just basic level information in, in, in the type of identity question that, that has been talked about over the last couple of days. And that information allows us to enrich the payment transaction flow for the different parties involved. What's interesting, and, and as we started to describe what this experience, uh, what this new service could do, we, we realized that um, one of the utilities of this, or one of the unique selling points, if you like, is the way that we'd reverse the payment flow from that of a typical transaction. So a request to pay will be um, initiated by the person who wants to be paid and they don't need to know anything necessarily other than, in some cases, nothing that happens behind the scenes or in the case of uh, the PayM example, your mobile phone number, et cetera. As a small business, it's a mini invoice. But actually, I, I'm requesting money and then I can simply receive that request and, and authorize it if I'm happy with it. So, um, quick second polling, just to wake you all up in case you uh, haven't been paying attention. Um, Audience polling, please. Uh, how many countries are currently implementing a real-time automated clearinghouse, real-time payment system, immediate payment system? How many countries are currently implementing a new real-time payment system? Okay, if we can have the... That's pretty good. You guys are on the ball, I think changing. <laughs> I, th I think the trend is clear though. Um, if I asked that question 12 months ago, the answer was two. We've been in the first category, easily in the first category. We expect that um, that will go above 20 next year. Some of those countries will obviously go live with their new systems. Again, I think that links back to the point around this is a global trend. Uh, it's difficult to ignore it. Well, actually, it's not difficult to ignore it. We can ignore it if we want to. Um, but actually, I think there's so much opportunity created by the, 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 the ability to invest in a new infrastructure that actually as soon as the markets make the decision to do it, the focus shifts from should we do it to what can we do with it, uh, and that's when 
the magic actually does start to happen in those markets. So, um, last couple of minutes, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about access. Um, access becomes a critical factor. The previous speaker talked about it as well. Access increasingly, the, the landscape is changing. Uh, in relation to access, and, and governments are increasingly supportive of uh, banks of all shapes and sizes having direct access payment systems, and also non-banks having direct access. And this is something that we, as, as another part of this sort of service of portfolio or, or capabilities that we deliver as part of the uh, real-time payment system, um, we, we spent time investing in a payment gateway the IPS system that is deployed in Singapore and the US and Thailand and so on uh, comes with a lightweight gateway that is deployed on the bank side. Uh, we've developed some partnerships around the world, particularly with ACI, to enable um, a, a simple and efficient low-cost upgrade path for a bank to get connected into the new central in infrastructure easily and quickly. We have two tiers of service, the, the, the initial basic gateway that we export internationally in the UK, we've built on the gateway and developed more capability, um, stand-in, uh, key functionality. I if something happens on the bank side in terms of technology infrastructure and it goes down, the customers will be insulated from those problems on the bank side. The gateway will stand in for a certain period of time and with certain constraints to prevent um, the customer being aware of any challenges on the technology front. Uh, message format flexibility, so if a bank is finding it difficult to schedule the implementation of a 20022 gateway, then we'll offer them an adapter converter that will take the 8583 message, convert it into the 20022 into the central infrastructure and back out again. We've actually done some of that in Thailand to help some of the banks meet the very um, pressing deadline that the government set for them. So access is um, absolutely critical. Um, I talked about bank friendliness, and, and I, I think <coughs> we set up as Vocalink, given our current shareholders, and, and that is changing, as some of you probably know, but we, we developed our proposition to be bank friendly. Um, so things like ubiquity, portability, convenience for consumers and businesses, main drivers for adoption, putting the bank account, giving the banks the tools to fight back against that increasingly complex landscape increasingly noisy landscape of new entrants defending against revenue erosion, some self-cannibalization helps. And um, what I heard from Steve in his opening address actually, uh, and it's been a consistent theme, is the great community here in New Zealand in particular, and the way the industry collaborates and works together through the forums, that is absolutely critical should New Zealand choose to make decision to invest in some new infrastructure. Those markets around the world that do this well are the markets that have clearly defined industry bodies that play the coordination role, um, that play the engagement role, that, that prevent the 50 voices complicating and um, disrupting the process to move forward. I can't underestimate how important that is. And in markets where that, that sort of fundamental infrastructure doesn't exist, they've actually had to create it very quickly in order to ensure that their, their national program, in, in which it is in most cases, uh, can implement effectively. Um, we, I think one of the things that um, I think best captures the transition of Vocalink from being a UK domestic clearing provider to um, a, a global commercial payment provider uh, it is basically the way in which we have been able to, and in some cases been fortunate actually, to find ourselves in that position in the UK of being a practitioner and an operator. And the conversations we have with countries around the world, we don't have those conversations from the base of I've, I've just got a bit of software to sell you. Not that that isn't important, but the credibility that we bring is being a practitioner and operator in our home market. So when we have a conversation, we have that conversation with, we understand what's important to you. We understand that if it doesn't work, it's a problem. We understand that 
security, resilience, scalability, uh, consumer interaction, um, industry engagement, we understand that these things are absolutely critical. And that's what makes a successful implementation. So. Immediate payments are like cash, only better. They are just as convenient, portable and certain. But immediate payments are also better than most other payment types, offering greater security, tighter cash management and a lower risk of failure. If you are a payments provider, Vocalink Real-Time Technology offers a strategic platform that is proven, truly multi-channel and supports the launch of new, exciting overlay services. There are an unlimited number of use cases for immediate payments, spanning P2P, B2B and N-Commerce. Real-life examples include insurance payouts, short-term loans and the payment of daily and weekly wages. Here we consider an online retail purchase, but we could similarly show the payment of a business invoice or household bill. Vocalink IPS supports ISO 20022 messages to maximize flexibility and enrichment of basic payment details. This global standard supports the development on numerous value-adding propositions like requests for payment or the inclusion of invoice information with payments. Our IPS platform supports a variety of transaction types including debits, credits and requests for payment messages. Using our proven gateway, IPS streamlines bank integration to provide instant message validation while maintaining secure connectivity to the main switch. With its modular construction, it can meet specific user requirements and will support any individual currency. Our technology has been continually proven in some of the world's most demanding payments markets. Vocalink IPS supports thousands of simultaneous transactions per second, having been specifically designed to operate as a national payments infrastructure. Real-time payments mean better cash management. Money can be managed with greater precision and confidence than ever, making budgeting easier. Our platform allows all participants to benefit from our processing speed and scale. Vocalink IPS is built to support thousands of participants within a market. A credible alternative to cash and card payments, real-time payments must run on technology that is proven, resilient and always available. Vocalink is the power behind the faster payment service in the UK, which is the global standard bearer for real-time payments. Our technology offers 99.99% availability and our resilient deployment ensures that transactions are always safe. We have a deep understanding of the design, development and operation of national payments infrastructures. Vocalink IPS is the power behind the fast service in Singapore and will soon be deployed in the USA as part of a drive to introduce universal real-time payments to the largest payments market in the world. We're Vocalink, powering economies, empowering people. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate the time and uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Paul, I'm sure many people are wondering when you're coming down here to set up. <laughs>